This is Breakthroughs. I'm Erin Spain, Communications Director at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Although COVID-19 doesn't necessarily discriminate, some communities are far more susceptible to the virus. People who are Black or African American are more likely to contract the virus and to die from it. Here in Chicago, Black residents make up about 30% of the population, but currently account for more than half of the city's COVID deaths. Vice Dean of Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Clyde Yancey, joins us to discuss the underlying causes of these outcomes from an editorial published in JAMA. Dr. Yancey is also the Chief of Cardiology in the Department of Medicine. Thanks for being back on the show, Dr. Yancey. I'm delighted to be back on the show, and I'm really grateful that you've selected this as a topic for us to discuss, as I think it's vitally important. So really thank you for this opportunity. Absolutely. Tell me, when did this emerge, this um, statistic, really, that more Black and African-American individuals were dying from COVID-19? It's a very interesting story. We were involved in reviewing some of the early reports coming out of China describing the consequences of the COVID-19 disease, which is attributable to the coronavirus infection. And because of our unique focus on cardiovascular diseases, we were vetting that information and a recurrent theme emerged for those persons with hypertension, diabetes, or pre-existing cardiovascular disease. There was clear evidence that if the coronavirus infection had led to COVID-19 disease, then the more disturbing complications of COVID-19 disease requiring mechanical, mechanical ventilation needing renal replacement therapy or dialysis, and ultimately death, were happening in those with pre-existing hypertension, diabetes, or already established cardiovascular disease. That triggered a thought, because that is exactly the profile of many of the underrepresented communities in our country, but particularly the African-American community. We continue to vet the information appropriately that we were receiving from China and then from Europe. And when the public health statistics emerge out of Chicago, demonstrating that 50% of the infections were impacting African-Americans and 70% of the deaths, 70% of the deaths were in the African-American cohort compared to the representation of the population. It's a bit of a trite expression, but clearly we had a problem, and it was something that needed further elucidation. And it's not just Chicago. This is happening in Louisiana, Detroit, Michigan, parts of New York. So that's where this became very personal for me, because we saw the data in Chicago. And as we began to pay attention to the Illinois Department of Public Health statistics, we recognized that not only were Blacks disproportionately affected, that is a higher infection rate and a very worrisome higher death rate. But it was completely sobering to discover that almost all of this increased activity in the black community could be traced to just five neighborhoods on the South side. Pause for a moment and think about that. The statistics are what they are affecting blacks. But in Chicago, the pain point could really be narrowed to a cluster of just five communities. That immediately said, this is not a phenomenon of just someone's race. This is a phenomenon attributable to someone's life and living circumstances. Then when we saw the data from Michigan, largely driven by what was going on in Detroit, which replicated this. And then in my home state of Louisiana, where once again, we saw this dramatic increase in the rate of death affecting African-Americans in a state that is known for the epicenter of so many health disparities. It really became evident that we had not just a local question in Chicago, but a national crisis and a crisis that wasn't just COVID-19 anymore, but a disproportionate burden of disease that was being accentuated by the pre-existing disparities and now being greatly exaggerated by the burden of COVID-19. It really generated a signal that we could not ignore. And it really required 
our attention, our rapt attention, at trying to collate as much information as possible and understand what can we learn from what's available and how can we make this a change moment where we say, finally, we have seen enough and it's compelling. If we are who we say we are as a civil society, there's no way we can allow this kind of disproportionate suffering to occur. Then we have to begin to say, this is our pivot point. This is when we finally say, disparate health is not an attribute that we wish to own anymore. We need to go forward and, th and strive for health equity. You wrote about this recently in JAMA in an editorial. Tell me, what reaction did you get from your peers out here in the medical community? Well, I've been humbled. The reaction has been substantial. Um, many people have been aligned. Many people have wanted, what do we do next? Many people have shared my angst, my concern. But what has really, really captured my attention is that it's not just people in the greater Chicago land area that have responded, other people in the Midwest, or not just people at a national level. I've heard from people all across the country. But the international community, Canada, just this morning, I got an email from a physician in South Africa, Italy, Germany. On this weekend, I'm speaking to a group of physicians in Brazil. I mean, we really have been able to illuminate a smoldering concern that wasn't just in Chicago. This smoldering concern of health inequity is worldwide. And I think we've been able to, not just me, but I think COVID-19 has incited a worldwide discussion about the importance of health and the presence of health inequity. There are some real obstacles facing uh, these communities as far as social distancing, which has been the utmost strategy to prevent people from spreading the virus. Can you explain why social distancing might be difficult or maybe even impossible in some of these communities right now? So the intuitive question is to say, okay, I get it. Blacks are having this condition at a higher rate. Same thing can be said, by the way, for persons living in nursing homes. Same thing can be said for persons living on Indian reservations. And then you tell me that Blacks are dying disproportionately. What's the story? It really is a dichotomous story. On the one hand, the infection rate really is attributable to the life and living circumstances. If you are not able to work from home, if you are an essential employee and you have to be in the workplace engaging with others because your job is deemed to be essential for our society to keep functioning. If you live in a circumstance because of housing density where you cannot maintain six feet away from your grandparent or from your sibling or your, your spouse, all of a sudden you begin to recognize that the very thing that we believe works social distancing is very challenging. And then you couple that with the availability of hand sanitizers, being able to acquire masks, and you begin to realize that there are certain communities, if for no other reason than their life and living circumstances, simply cannot do the two things in the beginning of this that we thought was so vitally important, social distancing and strict hand hygiene as a consequence, we see this disproportionate tripling, tripling of the infection rate. And then when the coronavirus infection occurs, because of this trio of obesity, hypertension, and diabetes in some or pre-existing cardiovascular disease and others are both of those big considerations, the consequences of this disease have just been ravaging. And it really has been the most sobering experience I think I've ever had in medicine. Are you seeing patients in the hospital right now? Have you been interacting with patients that have been coming through with COVID-19 who are from the Black or Latinx communities? Now, I am separated from the hospital by one degree, in part because of leadership, in part because of my age and my risk. But I have my own patients that are in the hospital with COVID-19. So I am the liaison between the bedside teams and the families and help process the information and participate in decision making. So day to day, I feel the burden of this condition. I experience the suffering that my patients are experiencing. I feel the pain, the deep pain that their family members are experiencing when they can't be there and they're trying to use any format possible 
but I also see the character of our nurses who are at the bedside and providing comfort, not just the mechanics of bedside care, but providing comfort. I see the incredible courage of our physicians who won't retreat, who won't say no, and are doing everything possible to keep people alive. And I see the integrity of all of the healthcare workers at every stage who have put it out there and say, I'm stepping up, I'm going to be a part of the solution. It's been a remarkable experience to witness uh, what I've seen. It says much about the soul of the people involved and about the commitment of the institutions involved, the institution being North Western. We know our health care workers really are going that extra mile, working day and night. Um, I'm wondering, though, if you have any ideas about what can be done at a public health level at this point in the pandemic to maybe address what's happening. Are there interventions or anything that could be done at this point? What we need to do very precisely is to recognize that this isn't over. We may have seen the surge. We may, in fact, be in the plateau, but the tail will be very long, meaning it's going to last a long. This isn't over. We need to be relentless and continue to promulgate the exact same public health messaging strict hand hygiene, social distancing, masking whenever you can't practice social distancing. This needs to be de rigueur. This needs to be how we live our lives right now. We should not relax. Yes, slowly more businesses will open, more in some states than in others, but we will see more activities that will begin to occur. But the public health messaging should not fatigue because we will see more cases. So that's the most important immediate strategy. When this does dissipate, the bigger strategy is going to be about preparedness. We can't let this happen again. We need to stand up the resources necessary. So should this happen again, and many of us believe that some iteration of it may happen maybe as early as next flu season, we need to have all of the hardware, all of the resources, all of the equipment necessary so we can respond quickly, respond decisively, and we can start early with the public health messaging. Lessons learned will be incredibly important once we experience something like this again. Hopefully we won't experience a pandemic ever again in my lifetime, but we will experience flu-like illnesses that could be substantial and we need to be better prepared the next time. You've described how personal this has felt um, for you. Yet in the JAMA article, you were you were hopeful. You didn't end the article with despair. Tell me about that. What is there to be hopeful about now? As you mentioned, as we're looking forward to the long tail of this sort of wrapping up and coming to an end and what comes next, what are you hopeful about? I don't think there's any constructive ground to be covered if we only indict our systems and impugn those delivering care or not delivering care as we think it should be. There's no gain there. I think the gain is to say out of every circumstance an opportunity emerges. A moment is realized where we can understand what we should do differently, what we can do better. And I think those of us that are looking at how systems come together and evaluating how populations are being affected, we have the ability to develop a narrative and say, this is what we've seen under these circumstances and what we've seen is not acceptable and these are the things we need to do differently. So in my written statements, I have tried to make the argument that ultimately this is not about a step one, step two, step three. It really is about a commitment. And I say that because every single time this country has made a commitment to tackle a big problem. We've won. You can think about civil rights, voting rights, fair housing. There's so many things where as a country we said, this is it, this is important, and this is how a civil society intends to live and treat its own. I think now we have to add the elimination of health disparities to that big agenda. And so it's less about an articulated list and more about a commitment. You know what? Everyone will sit back and say, oh boy, that's hard. You can't rebuild society. It only takes will. We just have to be willing to decide that what we've seen is not acceptable, that this will not be an an attribute that defines who we are as a society. We have to say, no, we are going to do things different. I smile when I listen to people 
long for normalcy because normalcy was not a normal life for many, many people. I pause when I hear talk, people talk about a new normal. I agree there's going to be some newness, some novelty, something different whenever that occurs. But what I really espouse is a better normal. A better normal where we value health, where we embrace public health, emergency preparedness, where we believe that health is the ultimate luxury and it's something we want to provide for as many people as possible, and where health equity is really the goal. Every time we've set goals in this country, every time we've set goals, we've attained them. But it has to be the big collective way. There has to be uh, that clarion call that everybody sees, that you can't look the other way. You see this and you say, no, it's just not how we function. And if that happens, if the will is there and we make the commitment, then I believe that change will come. Dr. Yancey, thank you so much for your insight and your leadership during this time. I know there's a lot of folks at Feinberg uh, who study health disparities, and I, I hope that more will be coming on this topic that will really change the minds uh, in our medical community and our society. Well, I'm grateful to you and many others in the media for um, really helping us take this message to the next level. If we can just get a few more people to subscribe to this way of thinking, and they get a few more people to subscribe to this way of thinking. That's how change starts. It never starts with some big announcement. It's just this groundswell of people saying, no, we gotta do things differently. So thanks for your help, appreciate it. Be sure to subscribe to the Breakthroughs podcast so you can stay up to date on the latest COVID-19 research from Feinberg faculty.